welcome to yet another Sunday in the Easter season. The theme today is joy. I'm glad you chose to be with us. May the message and the music lift your heart in praise to God. Next Sunday, we will share in the Lord's Supper. Now, our liturgist is Norton Christensen. Let us begin our service. Let us come before God with all who we are, struggling to meet the day or ready to meet the day. No matter how we are feeling, we acknowledge with the Bible, this is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. that we need to remove. To do that, we, let us pray. Amazing, Amazing God, God, even, even though, though you rolled the stone away from the entrance to Jesus' tomb, some of us still have a stone blocking the entrance to our hearts. Some refuse to change their attitude or change the direction of their life. Today, or perhaps today, we will be different. Give us the will and the courage to be changed by your powerful Holy Spirit and by the wonderful news that Jesus arose from the dead. Perhaps we too can arise from our doldrums. We pray for it in the name of our risen Savior. Amen. Anyone who is in Christ becomes a new creation. The past is finished and gone. Everything becomes fresh. And new. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
boys and girls, today we have changed the Apostles banner that we had on up during Holy Week to this banner that says Alleluia. And Alleluia is Latin for praise the Lord. It's a word that has been used by the church throughout the years. And this banner includes symbols. Symbols are things that stand for other things to just give you in a picture a reminder of what these are all about. And I've asked that this page be included in your mailing so that you can see that. The slanted cross and the crown reminds us that Jesus became king after he carried his cross for us. The butterfly uh, reminds us that a caterpillar moves across the ground and turns into a beautiful flying butterfly. Likewise, Jesus rising from the dead allows us to one day fly away. This is a plant, a plant flower called a pomegranate. The bursting forth of the fruit and the release of the seeds are symbols of resurrection like Jesus bursting forth from his tomb. This is the monogram of Jesus. It's fancy lettering, but it is an I-H-S, and it's the first three letters of Jesus' name in Greek, which is the language that the New Testament was written in. And then this is the, um, the Cairo, the Greek letter Chi looks like an X, and the Rho looks like a P, and it's the first two words uh, first two letters for the name of Christ. Christ means uh, the anointed one. It's not a last name, it's a title. And then down here, the shell is included with water droplets and it's a reminder of the sacrament of baptism. And these uh, grapes and wheat are a symbol of Holy Communion. You can print this out at home so that you can have it and remember some of the symbols of Easter that will continue to be lifting us up this day and in the weeks ahead. Let us pray. Dear God, as boys and girls have gone through the season of Lent and has certainly wondered about the cross and about Jesus and about uh, things happening to him, now we can rejoice. Now we can be glad because of what Jesus has done it brings new life to us and can give us life beyond this lifetime too. We are so grateful for that. In his name we pray. Amen. Let us pray. Send your Holy Spirit, O God, to open our hearts and minds to what we are about to hear. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first lesson this week is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, 
Oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them the things about himself and all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, Jesus walked ahead of them as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Some broken hearted Christians walked down a dark and Wondering if the Savior would indeed appear at last. Then in time of hopelessness, hope appeared again. The risen Lord had come to join dejected friends. I am Our second lesson 
is from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Leslie Weatherhead, the great London preacher and author of books like The Will of God and The Christian Agnostic, remembered a day in his childhood when he was walking with a nurse along a country road and three children ran to greet him. He didn't know them, but in their hands, as an offering to him, they brought small branches of sycamore crowned with beautiful bronze-colored leaves, and they offered it to him. They presented their gifts. But young Leslie was shy and suddenly ran back to cling to his nurse. And when he looked back, he still could remember the disappointment written upon, across their faces. For days afterward, he remembered that event as what, and was chagrined by his actions. The children's offer, he wrote, surprised me in some weakness of snobbery or fear, but in which I should have seen the kingdom of heaven and taken it with joy. Just a gift being offered freely, and he turned away. What Weatherhead's behavior is a parable for us all. How many times, perhaps when we were younger, did you find yourself doing a similar thing, shying away? from a nice offer? There was an offer that could have brought joy, and instead it brought chagrin. Where do we discover joy in our lives? As some meet the day, they go for their breakfast on autopilot and drive to their destination with grim determination not to be cut off or distracted by others. One Friday several weeks ago, when Marianne and I drove over to the beachside to eat, my joy got trounced at one particular street corner where people with profanity-laced political signs waved their flags and yelled at cars. Sometimes joy cannot flourish in my heart for long because of what I see in public or on television, but the times when I find joy are precious. On the other hand, people who are joyful about everything seem disconnected with reality to me. I wonder if the so-called joyful in the Lord Christians have an occasional bad day. If they do, they seem to coat it with joy. Then I have to stop and ask, what bothers me about this joyful Christian, this joyful server, or this joyful store clerk? Is it envy that they have joy and I don't? Is it anger? I don't think it's either of those. I've come to realize something important. It's not the joyful people. It's the joyful people um, that seem to produce it artificially and constantly, that seem to maybe not have the joy that I am wanting to possess and to share. Those who face Death in joy, violence in joy, pain in joy, suffering in joy, and don't show grief. I love the joyful Christians in this congregation, and I remember ones who are gone now. They seem to have the Spirit of God in their heart and the fruit of the Spirit apparent in their life. In Paul's letter to the Galatians, he outlined the fruits of the Spirit. The first fruit is love, as you might expect, but the second one is joy. Joy is one fruit of the Spirit that I, and perhaps you, need to nurture in our lives. 
Throughout the century, sometimes congregations have existed stoically, holding fast to the commandments, while others practiced joy and invited others into their fellowship. Perhaps the greatest Christian failing over the ages was to turn our faith into something stoic, legal, and stern. The Jewish Pharisees, the holy legalists, would be in general agreement with what some churches represent, joyless adherence to the teachings of the Bible, including the commandments. But in the early church described in the book of Acts, the joy of the Lord was evident. And Jesus said in John 15, 11, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Or Paul's words to the Philippians as translated in the Good News Bible, quote, I thank my God every time I think of you, and every time I pray for you all, I pray with joy because of the way in which you have helped me. May we always seek to have such joy in our union with our Lord. As Paul wrote it so clearly, rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I will say rejoice. Philippians 4.4 4. Even before Paul and Jesus a number of psalms declared the power of joy. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you who are righteous. Psalm 32, 11. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice. Psalm 33, 20 through 21. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Psalm 105, verse 3. And perhaps the greatest verse on this subject from Psalm 118, This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's certainly a part of God's will that we will rejoice in our lives. Sometimes I fall short. Do you? All that Jesus suffered for us on the cross and all he shared was not so that we could suffer with him daily. Only he could atone, that is, pay for, all the world's sins, and he doesn't need our help to do it. Instead, he said to his disciples, Your sorrow shall be turned to joy. I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice. The joy that fills much of the world around the birth of Christ is enhanced with people offering tidings of comfort and joy. And the joy that Christ has risen from the dead is augmented by this grand hymn that we will sing, this joyful Easter tide, away with sin and sorrow. My love, the crucified, has sprung to life this morrow. Had Christ, who once was slain, now burst his three-day pit prison, our faith had been in vain. But now is Christ arisen, 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 arisen. An ethics professor when I was at Princeton, Dr. Doris Donnelly, did some extensive research on the subject of joy. In her research, she discovered, among others, C.S. Lewis, who I mentioned last week. Lewis said that joy surprises, hence the name of his autobiography, Surprised by Joy. He learned as a child that joy was hard to attain, but intensely desirable. Second, he, he learned that joy was different from pleasure or happiness or fun or excitement, although it's frequently confused with those experiences. He said, with joy, the desire itself is to have an experience as a delight, even when fulfillment seems remote or impossible. Finally, Lewis said that joy coexists with pain. He wrote, in the midst of affliction, joy gives proof of its power. So you and I have the power to move from dark gray toward light blue regarding our mood, 
rather than let life dictate how we will feel or respond. How freeing is that, that we have to choose joy. Those who have done that have trusted and thanked God in all circumstances, and it's that simple, but really that difficult. Choosing joy can make your body, mind, and soul healthier. Finally, in Max Lucado, like Max Lucado's wonderful devotional book, Grace for the Moment, he wrote, each day I am free to choose. Because of Calvary, I am free to choose. And so I choose love, he said at first. And then he decided, I choose peace. And then he said, forgiveness. And I knew I was with him on all those points, especially forgiveness. I once went months not forgiving another person, and it sapped my energy every day, drained my spirit, and changed my mood. I certainly have decided for forgiveness. And then his last point, and I choose joy. And he says, I think that means I can't wait for joy to fall into my lap. I have to choose activities that enhance joy. Political wrangling saps my joy. So does hearing about drug overdoses and affairs. So does hearing about harm coming to Ukraine's armed forces and civilians. Yet the words from the prophet Zephaniah are these. The Lord your God will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. Zephaniah 317. May you cherish words of joy that you hear and fill your life with activities that bring you joy. Amen. As we sing that hymn I mentioned.
Let us pray. O oh God, who has set us in a world of soaring beauty and profound mystery, who has enclosed our years within the eternal context of fragrant spring mornings and sparkling winter nights, who has granted us over the years the lilt of lively companionship, the provo provocation of ideas and personalities, the sheer clear point of joy in creating a thing of loveliness or of excellence, the steady, solid support of friendships tried and tested. For these, we thank you. Above all, we thank you for the first flowering of conscience. We look back and we recognize in ourselves the dawning of a conviction that life is not simply a random series of opportunities and disappointments. We look back and we acknowledge that our life has been a gift, a gift to be accepted, savored, a gift to be lived out, fully lived out between the twin poles of freedom and responsibility. Now we step forward in this freedom and this responsibility, free in the knowledge of how little is really essential, responsible in the conviction of how much is desperately needed. Help us, living God, to maintain this tension, this heart-rending, heart-healing tension, and in all this, grant us grace. That elusive tenderness blesses all that it touches, that lightens every load, that sings in every song and dances in every step, that grace, which is the flame of love, leaping up in our hearts and setting our lives afire. As we think about the things in the world that trouble us and burden us, we ask for your spirit to lift up our hearts so that your countenance may show from us and the light of Christ may be apparent in us. In this time, we ask for this guidance and blessing in the name of our risen Savior, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Take, take this time, if you will, to prepare any offerings you may want to give to this congregation. They can be mailed in. They can be done through the website online with a credit card if you wish. But we are grateful always for your support. And we ask for your offerings and then we will bless them. Thank mm -hmm. you.
send to us. Please receive and bless these, our gifts, that we have brought to you through this congregation. We pray that are used to spread the good news with joy. In the name of Jesus, amen. seeking to claim joy, not just have it fall into your lap, so that your countenance may be changed in the week ahead. As you go, the love of God uphold you, the Spirit of God empower you through the Son of God who was born, lived, died, and lives again for you. Amen. <laughs>